the 15th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Wednesday the 5th of June and in this episode we're going to discuss what's been in the news. We'll also be talking about the latest happenings in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Mark. I'm back. And Hooray. joining me this week are Tony. Hello. And back. Laura. Hello. In any order it says here. <laughs> that was a not for somebody else. Right. So you're back. Do you have a nice time? Climb. Time. Time. I did have a nice time. I'm just Good. trying to remember what I was spending that time doing. Conference? Oh, no. It, was a, it wasn't as, as uh, interesting as that. It was a meeting. It was, oh. Actually, no. It was a, actually a fairly interesting meeting. <laughs> in but case anyone's was, listening. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the people who were in the <laughs> meeting. For yeah, contractual reasons, it was a very interesting meeting. <laughs> <laughs> but no. So, yes. It was... Uh, good but it meant i couldn't be here so it was bad well it's good to have you back alan is away messing about on a boat Mm, i'm sure we'll be hearing all about that yes with some other geeks yes so yeah yeah good luck to him (laughs) with that one um right oh should we get on with it sounds like a fun packed show And it's time for some news. So, first up, uh, Matt Garrett has written a blog post explaining why having secure boot support within Linux doesn't solve the problem of the Windows tax. It turns out it's not possible to avoid accepting the Windows 8 license agreement because of something called fast boot, which effectively disables the keyboard. I actually fell foul of this um, oh. a couple of mm. weeks ago when I was trying to um, re- well, trying to install Linux on a netbook for a friend. Okay, um, a Windows 8 a, netbook. A Windows 7 netbook, which oh. could, was incapable of doing anything because it was too busy running Windows. <laughs> so I put Lubuntu, I tried to put Lubuntu on it. I made a bootable USB, plugged it in, and it didn't do anything. It just kept on booting Windows. And it turned out that the reason for that was because um, fast boot in the BIOS was enabled, which meant it didn't um, start, well, it didn't look for USB devices. Yeah. It basically, Microsoft's got a benchmark that says it must boot within so many seconds, and that means that it doesn't have time to look for USB, apparently. Yeah, because you've got to wait for things to initialise and time out and then say, oh, is there stuff there now? Yeah. Um, which, so, which is okay, because yes. improving your boot performance is a good thing. Yeah, for yeah. the, for the you know, odd occasion when you might want to boot from USB. Yeah. That's, you know. But the problem is that if you are running... If you want to select something other than the first hard disk to boot off, you yeah. need to be able to get into the operating system. Into in the order, in, Well, you need to be oh, able sorry, to get into right, the operating yes. system to be able to set a flag to say, next time, don't do fast boot and let me into the BIOS so I can pick what to boot from. Yes. I mean, it, it would normally be possible to say, you know, hit Dell as it or, or F2 sometimes yeah. as it boots and go into the menu and say, turn off fast boot. But if you're using a USB keyboard, then it's not finding it because it's not looking for USB. Yes. So you have to boot into Windows and say, don't do fast boot next time. Which is okay if you want to keep your Windows. Yes. But if you have bought a brand new system with Windows 8... The first thing you do when you get when you turn on is the kind of pre-install bit where you have to put your name and a password mm. and stuff in. I imagine I haven't actually used it myself, but that's what all the other Windows yeah, distributions what, what have done. What you've been told yes. by uh, your sources. This is what I read on the internet. Um, <laughs> but that's what you have to do with other Windows versions. So it's that first kind of boot initialization yeah. process. The problem is there's no option before you go through that process to reboot into the BIOS. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's not the BIOS anymore. It's the, it's the secure UEFI UFI thing. So <laughs> UEFI. <laughs> So you have to accept the Windows license agreement in order to be able to get into Windows properly, in order to be able to tell it to let you get into the into the secure boot BIOS thing. Mm-hmm. So you can't not accept the Windows uh, license unless you dismantle the uh, computer and take the hard disk out. And then right. it will go, ah, oh, I have no hard disk. What do you want me to boot from? Yeah, yes. and then throw an error. So Right, which isn't exactly something that your average um, Joe Schmo user is going to be doing. No. But then are they, I don't know. Is the average Joe Schmo user going to be installing Linux in the first place? Well, yeah, instead of the stock Windows that Mm. it came with, possibly not. But it's also still annoying for people like us Mm -hmm. who have to, yeah, especially say you've got a laptop. Brand new laptop. Exactly. You have to start taking it apart before you can even use it. Exactly. It sounds reasonable to me. (laughs) (laughs) Pass me the screwdrivers. (laughs) Just got a new Dell. That doesn't uh, violate your BIOS, uh, violate your Your warranty warranty at all in any respect whatsoever, taking it apart. Hmm, yes, a bit of a problem. Oh, well. Yes. 
Mont. Oh, oh, am I going to get this right? No. Monty Widenius? Widenius? Widenius. I'm going to go with Widenius. I like that. Um, principal founder of the MySQL database, has warned that companies are no longer giving back to open source software, even if they remain heavy users of it. The answer, he suggests, is to restrict what businesses can do with the software without paying. Okay, so back in the day, there used to be a sort of vague kind of commitment that other companies, even if their first business wasn't software development, yeah. but they were using heavily a particular piece of open source software, they would contribute a, a developer's time towards it. Mm -hmm. So perhaps somebody who was using Samba um, would contribute a Samba developer right. to back to the project, and then they would benefit from that developer's work, as well as all the other community developers. So what Monty's saying is that that Lots of people have anymore. stopped doing that now. Right. People will still rely on open source software and make it a core part of their business, but not contribute time or even money back. Mm -hmm. They take it for granted, really. Yeah. And obviously, you know, it's a strange economic world that we live in these days. Um, and maybe that's one of the things that somebody looking at it from an accountancy point of view might not understand why mm. we're doing. Yeah. So what he's suggesting, he he's tried to coin the term business source, yeah, which I, is brilliant. Um, so essentially, the license says it's open source as we understand it, except for if you're using it for this, this, or this reason, i.e. making money, then you have to pay for it, which yes. is incompatible with the current open source definition because it's restricting um, it, essentially how you're allowed to use it. It's not um, a, what's the word I'm looking for, a non-discriminatory non license. It's not free software. No, because you're placing a restriction on it. Yes. Well, <laughs> mm, it it doesn't... It, uh, I'm not going to get into free software versus open source software right <laughs> now. And the, the argument he makes is that because this is happening, it's actually ruining the open source software for everybody, including yeah. those businesses who are benefiting from it, because there isn't any progress really being made the way that it used to be made. Mm. Of course, what it could be is that um, his new company that he's made since he wasn't happy with what Oracle did with MySQL after he sold it to them yeah, um, isn't making enough money and now he's upset. But yeah. that's, that's just me being cynical, I'm sure. Well, he says it costs him a million euros for me to keep it ticking over. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure it does. Employing good developers costs money. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said he said half of that was, was the people and half of that is the infrastructure for doing things like builds and... Yeah. Um, yeah, community management. That sort of thing, yes. Fair enough. The Camino browser, which provided an open source browser option for Mac OS X users, is being discontinued. The project team have announced in a blog post that it's fallen behind modern browsers. Camino was essentially the Mac back in the days when Firefox was called Firebird. Yeah. Wow. It was, uh, yeah, it, a long time ago now yeah. that I knew about it. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, it, yeah, it was basically the first browser, I think the first sort of native looking browser on OS X. So when, at the time, everyone was using Internet Explorer on OS X mm. before Apple released Safari. Uh, yeah. And Camino used Coco, which is their sort of interface widget set, um, and Gecko, which is the browser from Mozilla at the time and Firefox now, um, and made a browser for OS X, which was popular for a bit and then firefox <laughs> got stable and came out on um every platform on every platform and then chrome got stable and came out on every platform and mm. safari got big on OS X, and there was no room for camino anymore yeah mm. and it used the same rendering engine as you say as firefox so it's yeah. kind of well what's the point you yeah. can kind of understand why they get they called it a day yeah i mean especially firefox around the sort of Firefox 3, Firefox 4 release did a lot of work on all the platforms, it possibly except Linux, yeah. and making it look a lot more native, at which point I suppose that was Camino's big um, sort of, point. Yeah, selling point at that, at that time. Yeah. Well, well, rest in peace, Camino. Raspberry Pi users can uh, now try Fedora on their teeny tiny computers thanks to the release of Pydora 18. Or uh, Pidora. Or Pidora, as I prefer. <laughs> uh, the latest release is optimised for performance on the Pi's ARM processor. Almost all of the Fedora package archive has been recompiled to run on the Pi. That's quite cool. Are you mm. going to be running it on your Pi, which you've got sitting behind you? I don't know. I'll probably just use whatever's, whatever the, the, the usual one is in the instructions for a start. 
Probably the Debian. Probably it's Debian, yeah. yeah. So Debian Squeeze, I think. There's a Debian version for the Pi and there's a Fedora version for the Pi now. Mm. But there's still no Ubuntu no version for the Pi, is there? Yeah, this was something to do with the type of ARM processor it uses not being currently supported by Ubuntu. But yeah. I think they're hoping that the next sort of iteration of the Pi will use either it will use a chip which is supported by Ubuntu or Ubuntu will have the time to support it. Is there a, a, a way of compiling the packages for the processor without doing it on that processor? Cross-compiling, yeah. Cross-compiling, okay. I'm sure there is. Get yeah. Matt Can't Garrett ex- onto it, it'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> He's I, not busy. Yeah, oh, it'll be fine. Otherwise, I could just see it taking a long time to you know, recompile the entire Ubuntu archive <laughs> or Fedora archive on a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think they compiled it on Raspberry Pis. I no. think they just compiled it for Raspberry Pis. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. Okay. Software security firm Coverity or Coverity? Coverity? Co- or Coverity? Pydora. <laughs> Software security firm Pydora. Have oh. Oh. <laughs> Whoever they are, they've analysed 450 million lines of software code and found that open source code had fewer vulnerabilities than proprietary equivalents. FFmpeg, XBMC and NTP had impressively lower error densities. Now, the statistics here are quite interesting, aren't yes. they, Tony? Yes, let's get into some statistical detail so I, they they got a jingle for that <laughs> statistical detail um was that your sexy voice again tony you have to ask <laughs> so <laughs> what happens with the statistics so they say that um open source software has a lower error density that is errors per lines of code yep. essentially than the in air quotes um in uh, industry average Yes. Is that right? So say that the industry average is one line of code per hundred, one error per hundred lines of code. Yeah, I think it's a thousand, but yes. One, oh, sorry, one error per thousand lines of code. They're saying that open source software is less than that. But they're also saying that proprietary software has less than that. Yes. So assuming that the industry is made of open source software and proprietary software, and they <laughs> both have, have error densities which are lower than one, then the industry average is lower than one. Yes. So that's sort of a bit meaningless. Yeah. The And in fact, across the average of all the samples that they tried, proprietary software was ever so slightly ahead of open source software. Right. So the headline that it's better than industry average is true only if the industry average is a meaningless number, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> but um, the, the takeaway is the more code you have, the more errors you have. Yeah. And interestingly, open source software was, was uh, quite a lot better than proprietary software for uh, lines of pro- uh, projects that were about 500,000 to a million lines of code. Um, whereas the res- reverse was the case for projects that were over a million lines of code. And there's a sort of suggestion that actually something that's open source and maybe has lots of casual contributors or, you know, or is a, is a quite a tight community around it mm. is quite well written. Yes. Whereas perhaps a, uh, a single developer writing uh, a proprietary application and putting it out there isn't subject to the same sort of scrutiny that an open source version yeah. is. Flip that around in a proprietary situation, you probably, by the time you've got over a million lines of code, you probably have a proper test framework, you probably have unit testing and regression testing, and hopefully, you know, actually some proper auditing going on of your code. Yeah. Whereas there's nothing to say you have to do that when you're a, a, an open source mm. project of that size. Yeah. And maybe you don't have the resources to do so. Mm. So, yeah, interesting, interesting points. Yeah. For the statistics geeks anyway and torrenters can expect the long arm of the law to find them as the city of london police have teamed up with fact and the bpi to make coal fact people they will be pursuing torrent sites who make dodgy downloads available for criminal gain so when we say dodgy downloads here are we talking about sort of viruses or are we saying stuff that the bpi considers dodgy the, BP, the BPI is the British Phonographic Industry, yes. essentially the record industry yes. in the UK. In fact, is the Federation Against Copyright Theft. They're the ones who put all the nice, friendly messages oh. at the beginning of the DVD, which you yes. just paid £15 for. Thank you very you much. You wouldn't mug mm. a granny. You wouldn't <laughs> steal a car, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, they're the people who do that sort of thing. Um, and they're kind of the movie industry. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's not to do with anybody spreading viruses particularly. It's people who are torrenting music and movies. Okay. And they're going off to uh, organise crime. In the city of London? Mm, well, yeah. With links to the city of London. Okay. Yeah. Organise crime with links to the city of London, you say? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like one for Sherlock, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so they're actually going to be sort of knocking on doors and, you know, taking down names, that sort of thing. Um, and the 
obvious expectation is that they'll be collateral with um, people who aren't organised criminals. They're just people yes. who maybe have down, down, downloaded a movie or two. Or using BitTorrent Sync to uh, keep their <laughs> files, their, their music collection in sync between their devices, as I'm now doing. Um, well, yeah, maybe. Mm. Uh, well, presumably that has you have to be going through some sort of central thing in order for them to track it, so the, the torrent file itself. Um, okay. So unless you're distributing the thing that allows other people to sync your music collection to their computers. Mm, I'm not. So you're probably And in right. fact, most BitTorrent these days is entirely peer-to-peer, so there's yeah. no central thing it's going through anyway. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see how they actually intend to uh, to do this. Yeah, and of course the, the government is not at all going to be relaunching the communications data bill, the Snoopers <laughs> Charter, in no, the next session of definitely Parliament. definitely not. No, definitely not. So it's all going to be fine, nothing to worry about. Good, right. Don't worry we about can signing also, up. We can all stop talking about this now. Yes. Everything's okay. Yes, don't go and sign up for the Open Rights Group, whatever you do. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that entertains, engages or enrages you, tweet at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. Please do get in touch. I mean it. Just one message. Just to know there's someone out there who cares. And now it's time for our community news. And the top news headline uh, from the community is that bug number one has been fixed and we can all go home now. Yay! What was bug number one, Tony? Bug number one was something like Microsoft has a majority market share. It was the first ever bug logged in Launchpad, which is Ubuntu's bug tracker. Um, it was logged by Mark Shuttleworth himself. Yeah. And he's now decided that there's been a fix released. So cool. it's it's done. Um, it's quite interesting to reflect how it has changed over the years that this was really focused on Microsoft's desktop yeah. market share and, you know, Ubuntu was setting out to maybe overturn that mm-hmm. or at least uh, make sure it didn't have a majority anymore. But the argument that Mark has put forward in his blog post is, uh, sorry, in his uh, closure message is really that actually Android and other platforms have a majority market share of devices now mm. and that we shouldn't be thinking about the desktop sector and that if you look at every all the computers in the world um, uh, microsoft doesn't have a majority anymore mm. does yeah. that make sense yes yeah and i think it's 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 a, quite a humble kind of comment as well yeah, because he didn't come out and say oh we're brilliant ubuntu's owning everything he's like well actually yeah he says android may may not be my or your first choice of linux but it is without doubt an open source platform that offers practical economic benefits to users in industry um so we've got competition and good representation for open source and personal computing and even though we've only paid a small part in that shift i think it's important for us to recognize Hmm. yeah i I quite like that um i haven't listened to the linux outlaws yet but i did look at their uh show notes and i think their approach probably fabs if i'm if i'm guessing um (laughs) is that it's a it's a failure it's an, an acknowledgement that um ubuntu will never overtake microsoft windows on the desktop um, the fact that this bug has been closed without that happening. Mm. Um, and it probably is the case, but the argument, I suspect, is that the desktop is it's not relevant anymore yeah. or, or, or not, less relevant. Not, yeah, not the only relevant thing. Yeah. So maybe there should be a new bug. Bug yes. 2 million. <laughs> yes. three. Android has majority market share on phones. <laughs> yes. Sort that one out, Mark. All right, then. Not you. <laughs> the rich one. Oh, <laughs> George Castro and Mark Kepi have spun up a play instance of Discourse, which is a new open source forum platform uh, from the people, including Jeff Atwood, who brought you Stack Exchange. This was discussed on a previous show, was it not? Um, I think we might have mentioned it, but um, George has put a Google Plus post up now, basically asking for people to um, play with it and f- feedback. So see if it's any if it's any good. So the old forum software that the Ubuntu forums runs on at the moment yeah. is a bit long in the tooth and not very good, basically mm. um, anymore. Not really fit for purpose. It took ages for them to retheme it with the new uh, theme because it was so difficult to do. Right. So this is hopefully a bit more of a modern forum platform that will give them a few more advantages over the old one that they're using at the moment. Mm. And not a, not a given that it will replace it at the moment, yeah. but um, that's, something new to try. Yeah, that's hopefully the objective. I think is probably you know looking for new things. And as you say, the same people have brought you Stack Exchange. Yeah. Can't go wrong there. So it's going to be interesting to see now that we've got Ask Ubuntu and there's quite a lot of 
um, activity on there in terms of questions and answers. What is, mm. if, if this does take off, what kind of things are going to be on there? Yeah. But a lot of people still use the Ubuntu forums, mm. even though there is st- uh, Ask Ubuntu and even though there are other discussion chat type forums yeah. for Ubuntu. So we shall see. Mm. Um, and errors.ubuntu.com has been opened up. So this is where all of those bug reports go when you say send an error report. Is that right? Yes, I believe so. Errors.ubuntu.com, um, website that shows things that are coming in, error reports, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think all you could see originally was basically a, a graph mm. of the number of things that are coming in. You couldn't actually see any useful yeah. information. There's, there's a note here, I guess it's from Alan, saying that even he who works for Canonical could only see the front page and not like all the detail about the stuff that's that's uh, sort of going in there. So now that's been uh, opened yeah. up to all. Well, uh, yeah, certainly you can apply to right. get access to the bug reports, which is presumably very helpful if you are maintaining a package. Yes. Um, and you can actually see those error reports. Otherwise, the question, I guess, is where were they going before? Mm. <laughs> they weren't automatically generating launchpad tickets or anything, I don't think. See, I have this vision for any of these pieces of software that says, would you like to send a report back when it crashes? I have this vision that there's this happy little report that's winging its way through and kind of taps on somebody's shoulder and says, look, this isn't working, go fix it. And then I have this sort of realisation that <laughs> yeah, I, probably it just disappears into I, a black hole. Of, and why am I bothering? There's an episode of Futurama with a load of messages going through pneumatic tubes and they all come out and just go into a big pile in the, ma- in the middle of a giant warehouse. That's the kind of thing that I imagine happening to them. I start off optimistic each time. <laughs> they sort of end up in a furnace somewhere. Yeah, so uh, all you can see without a, a log into the site is the big graph of, of packages and a list of the... Uh, packages that have the most uh, bugs being uh, right. filed against them, sorry, errors being submitted against them, um, which is useful. Um, but now if you're a developer, um, and including a Canonical employee, apparently, you can actually apply to get in and uh, access some of the detail behind those bug reports, which is a good thing. Cool. And big news, the community site is back. Oh, Thank goodness yes. for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Where were we without the community site? And not only that, it's linked from the top of all Ubuntu websites, like official Ubuntu websites. Wow. Absolutely. It's right back there in the ribbon. Um, after all the furore over the community link being pushed to the bottom of the page, uh, allegedly while the site was being redesigned, um, and linked... <laughs> <laughs> you reckon it sounds like there's a conspiracy you know of? No, I just that's what the that's what they said. It's being redesigned. We're going to move the link to the bottom while we well because it wasn't on brand, and then it now has been redesigned and is back up. So some things have, have changed. Um, there's a big picture of lots of people at UDS. Yeah, you it's know, a really cool picture. I can see is. Davey, I think. Yeah, you can see <laughs> Davey Gurning in the bottom of it, and um, friend of the show Graham Bins is in there as well. He's the oh, one. Oh, I've just found Davey. Yeah, that is quite a gurn, isn't it? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> if, that, if that doesn't put you off using Ubuntu, I don't know what will. Um, but no, uh, it's a nice thing to have a big picture from UDS, that thing that they don't do anymore, um, right yes. at the top of the community site. But there we go. Um, not not quite the same showing a picture of lots of Google Hangouts, is it? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's there. It's back. One of the other things that seems to have disappeared is the countdown widget. Oh, yes. Um, um, we, we did have a widget which we used to show a countdown to the next Ubuntu release on our website, but they taken that away now so we're going to have to do some other hackery to get the countdown to work yes it stops at twelve ten, and people were saying shouldn't this be replaced by now it's, the sale <laughs> says twelve ten. they didn't do it for 1304 we didn't notice yes and now people have told maybe us. i should write an open source a widget Ooh, i've just promised to do that haven't i oh dear you could use the excellent t- countdown timer from our website you yes repurpose which that has code, no bugs which is absolutely bug works free. in etc it works in every time zone yes it's, is it the same? Does it work in the same way that the uh, the BBC clock did? Um, How the BBC, did it work? There was a complaint put into the BBC Trust because the clock on the BBC website just showed the local time from the computer. Oh, well, we're paying for it, and um, and that was apparently not a trustworthy time source. Oh right. <laughs> so the BBC could have been telling a lie because the time might not have been correct, and somebody complained to the trust. Somebody with too much time on their hands. Um, it does use the. Uh, the time zone reported by the user's computer because previously it used the time zone reported by the server, which yes. is why we got some angry emails saying that we weren't on when we said we would be. <laughs> Indeed. Because as far as we were concerned, we were on at the right time because yes. the, ti- the time zone on the server is the same as our time zone. So they, 
the time zone thing, the the, the countdown thing is good because that's for our show. Yes. If Ubuntu is not supporting the the release countdown, yes. Can we not just get rid of it and save you rewriting it? Well, I could I could we take have. The, they they have a page, do they not? Which has a yes. countdown on, so I could capture the time from that page and display it, or I don't know, do something. We could have a countdown if we wanted. See, Canonical have just made this change to the community site and not, oh, not, not consulted not us. Consulted us. Uh, oh, dear, they just don't involve the again. community, do they? They just don't involve the community <laughs> enough. I'm going to file a bug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Brian Lunduke, Duke, a software developer and former Linux Action Show host, has open-sourced all the software that he writes to make his money, switching from a shareware model to donations. So he's been saying for quite a while that he will quite happily open source all of his uh, software that he writes as his business um if he can make enough money to continue living essentially yeah and he said about a year ago right if i get this many subscriptions like to pay this month yes. this much a month then i will open source all my stuff and it didn't work oh it didn't work no so now he's done it again and said right here we go everything's open source um i need to get five thousand dollars a month in donations which he reckons is, with, well, he he says he's got he's got a, a, an account of how um, how that breaks down, and he yeah. he says that that is a a small percentage of his user base, and uh, less than he's been making by selling it as proprietary or proprietary software or shareware was his model. It's a bit of a no going back kind of thing, though, isn't it? Kind of, yes. Mm. Um, unless, well, yeah, unless the versions he released are very buggy. <laughs> yeah. the, the the slightly disheartening thing is that he posted about um, a, nearly a week ago now, saying that in the first week he's got eight hundred and twenty uh, twenty one dollars, which is a great start. And I looked today, and he's got eight hundred and twenty one dollars. Oh, yes. So that's not looking amazing, but you never know. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think when you have things like Humble Bundle that are volunteered to pay how much you like, that yeah. sort of model, because there's always a new bundle with new software coming out and all the games are totally different, yes. people are prepared to chip in again. Yeah. Whereas if you have bought a particular game once, yeah. apart you, maybe from major upgrades... And exactly, things, you're, you're not probably going not, to be paying a bit every month. Exactly. Um, which I guess is what somebody like Brian needs in order to be able to support yeah. uh, you know, regular income and stuff. Mm. So, yeah, tricky, but interesting to see whether it will work. Yeah, he did mm-hmm. say that he's going to be looking at, you know, selling other ancillary products around, you know, like oh, okay. um, Lunduke software T-shirts and so on. Okay, wow. Which I'm sure we're all going to want. Yeah, I'm going to order one now. Well, cool. I can't, they're not available yet. But no, good luck to him, that's what I say. Oh, sorry, it's me. There will be hangouts with various Ubuntu teams like the Kernel team, Unity, Mia, Touch, etc. Uh, and people from tech blogs and news sites invited to ask more questions. So I guess this is uh, sort of a, a, well, it seems like a sort of mini UDS type thing to, to open up the teams to the community. Yeah, it seems a little bit like that. Um, but I like the idea of having people representing other communities coming along and asking questions yeah. so tech bloggers and things that is quite good um and making sure that there's that kind of open interface between the development teams and the r- the rest of the community the wider community is a good way of you know helping make sure that people don't perceive ubuntu as a closed shop i think mm. excellent well good luck with that one and finally in the community news dreamhost have announced that they are going to be moving to ubuntu Ooh. Ooh. so dreamhost are a massive cheap and cheerful uh, web host yeah. in the us in the united states um and they currently host on debian squeeze and they said basically debian's release rate is not predictable enough for them and their support cycles mm. or as ubuntu with an lts release will give them five years guaranteed security fixes and updates and they haven't got to worry about anything other than the customization they do they do on top of it yeah so which is quite cool because debian has historically been the thing which people use to run servers because it's stable and you can mm. install the stable version and it'll be fine um you know you can definitely rely on it but now ubuntu because it's got this release cadence which is what they've been working on mm. um for the past however many release cycles now that people have the confidence to say you know what because we know how long it's going to be supported for and when it's going to be released that's what we're going to stick with yeah 
I think it's been three years since the last Debian release, mm. and that will be supported for another year with security fixes and things. So they'll still be gaining a year by moving to Ubuntu, mm -hmm. even if you know a, a Debian. It's ironic, really, Debian being accused of not releasing of releasing too often yeah. in this case. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting move, and as a DreamHost customer myself, it will be uh, satisfying to have my Ubuntu podcast mirror hosted on an Ubuntu server, Hooray. rather than a Debian one. And we've got some events to talk, tell you about. What's up, Mark? The first one. Og Camp. Yay! Hooray! What's Og Camp? <laughs> Og Camp is a free culture on conference, which is variously uh, arranged by us and the Linux Outlaws and other happy little helpers. Yes. Um, and it is going to be on the 19th and 20th of October at uh, Liverpool John Moores University in Liverpool, which for those of you who came last year is the same place. <laughs> <laughs> Um, more details to follow. We yeah. should probably add that... Um, was this publicly announced today? Yeah, this was this was publicly announced today due to an error on Dan Lynch's part, <laughs> uh, who was supposed to send us an email telling us that the venue had been booked, but accidentally posted it to the Liverpool Lug mailing list. Yes. <laughs> and then got accused of favouritism by telling only local people. Yeah. The cat was well and truly out of the bag at that point, so yes. we thought so, we might yeah. as well, you know, tell everybody. So there'll be more details about hotels and stuff coming up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, log camp happening this year. Hey. And, and finally, not really an event, but there's a new Preston hack space. Cool. Um, there's a link where you can find out more, but they seem to have been having some meetings and doing the sort of things you do in hack space. Cool. Um, so yeah, go there and find out more about that. That's all for this episode. Oh, I did it, didn't I? Yep. Thank you for listening. Join us next time when we'll be interviewing Daniel Four. Was it Four Four A? I thought there was an accent over the E at one point. You about, have to know where it is on the keyboard. Oh dear. About elementary OS, reading your feedback, and no, we're not going to be talking to him about reading your feedback and making your life a bit easier with some command line love. I'm glad that's all clear. <laughs> I think it's 4A. So there's an accent over there. There we go. Yes. But yes, well, lots of people were asking us to talk to somebody from Elementary OS. So we put out some feelers, and Daniel was very kind to come say come on the show. So listen in next time and hear us talk to him. Cheerio then. Bye bye. bye. bye.